Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, I should say. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Mariana Garcia. I'm the Public Programs Manager here at the Old State House. And I want to thank you all for joining us today for the second installment in our Spring Limited Series, the State's Filing Cabinet, which is being done in partnerships with our friend uh, uh, the uh, Connecticut State Library. Uh, we started this series to highlight the value of Connecticut's public records in the study of our state's history and government. Connecticut has been preserving its records for centuries, and these documents serve to illustrate all kinds of stories of the people, places, and events in our past. Today's program is titled Managing and Safeguarding What's in the Cabinet, and uh, we are once again joined by some staff from the uh, Connecticut State Library. Uh, today we have Public Records Administrator Leanne Power, we have Records Management Analyst uh, Elise Marsik, Marsik? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Assistant State Archivist Alan Ramsey, and Government Records Archivist Damon Munz, who will be talking to us about what it takes to safeguard and make all of these uh, uh, make sure that all of these documents are preserved. So if you have any questions during today's program, uh, make sure to uh, raise your hand at the very end. I will come to you with a microphone. And uh, if you're watching us online, you can post your questions on the comment or in the chat of the video that you are watching. So allow me to introduce our speakers for the day. Leanne Power uh, is the Public Records Administrator at Connecticut State Library, the only the sixth individual to hold this position. She joined the State Library staff in 1994 as Supervisor of Record Services for the state agencies, then was promoted to record Rec uh, Public Records Grant Program Specialist in 2001, and then to Public Records Administrator in 2009. She is a native, of, a native of Minnesota and a graduate from the University of North Dakota with a degree in Information and Records Management. Uh, Elise Marsik uh, joined Connecticut State Library as Record Management Analyst in 2019 and has nearly a decade of experience in public records in both Connecticut and Massachusetts. She develops public records policies and procedures, works closely with state agencies on creating and revising retention schedules, conducts state and municipal trainings, and provides assistance to state agencies and municipalities on various records management matters. Alan Ramsey uh, joined the Connecticut State Library in 2010 as government records archivist and became assistant state archivist in 2013. He oversees the state archives acquisitions, arrangement, description, and preservation of state and local government records and non-government records of enduring value pertaining to the history and heritage of Connecticut. And finally, Damon Munz. Damon joined the Connecticut State Library in 2007 and became the government records analyst in 2013. His duties include serving as the liaison for the preservation of paper-based materials for state library staff, as well as a contact for state and local stakeho uh, stakeholders in the event of records disasters. He also oversees records transfers from state agencies and local governments, rehousing collections into appropriate storage containers, and provides reference uh, services for uh, archival collections. So thank you for all, all of you very much for being with us today, and uh, again, Let's start the presentations. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coordinating the three workshop series with the Connecticut State Library. Welcome to all of you who have joined us virtually, and also the individuals who arrived in person. Thank you much so much for or, um, coming to um, see our presentation today. There's a few CSL employees here as well. Thank you for coming to support us. To begin, I would like to provide you with some information about the State Library. The mission of the Connecticut State Library is to preserve and make accessible Connecticut's history and heritage and to advance the development of library services statewide. By statute, the State Library serves as the official archives for the state of Connecticut. It is a permanent home of the Connecticut General Assembly, official transcripts and legislative bill files, and it maintains comprehensive collections of Connecticut and federal government publications from the late 1700s to the present in support of the library's roles as a regional federal depository library and the Connecticut State Documents Depository. 
The first presentation of the file cabinet series was presented on May 25th by two members of the State Archives, State Archivist Lizette Pelletier and Digital Records Archivist Barbara Austin. Their session was on record keeping in Connecticut then and now. And if you were not able to see that, you can view that on YouTube on your leisurely time. During today's session, called Managing and Safeguarding What's in the Cabinet, we will discuss the management of state and municipal records, how records are appraised for archival and historical value, and the preservation of records. The Office of Public Records Administration is a department at the State Library that is responsible for designing and implementing a records management program for executive branch agencies, as well as the state's municipalities, political subdivisions, and certain public quasi-agencies. The authority is granted under Section 11.8, 11-8A of the General Statutes. The Public Records Office has been in existence for over 100 years. Just to give you a little history about the program, in 1903, Connecticut became aware of the need to monitor public records. In 1904, the first examiner of public records was appointed. In 1905, the legislature passed an act concerning a temporary examiner of public records. In 1911, the General Assembly creates the post of permanent examiner of public records as the assistant to the state librarian. George Goddard, who was a state librarian at the time, wrote to Lucius Barber on June 16, 1911, announcing that the State Library Committee had approved his appointment as a permanent examiner of public records. In his letter to Mr. Barber, Mr. Goddard says, quote, the legislation recently passed ought to enable you to do most important and valuable work for the state and its several towns." Unquote. I am comfortable in stating that the public records and archives departments continue to carry out this important work to this day, 112 years later. In addition to administering a records management program for municipal and state agencies, other responsibilities of our department include operating a state record center for state agency records, which is located in Rocky Hill, across from the Veterans Hospital. We administer a grant program for local government records in accordance with 11-8I through 11-8N. The Historic Document Preservation Grant Program continues to support municipalities in making significant improvements to the preservation and management of their most valuable records. Our office has awarded over $20 million since the grant's inception in 2000. We also identify and preserve essential state records, and we develop policies and procedures and regulations for any records-related topics. Other statutes dictate requirements for records maintenance, proper storage of records, disposition of records, or unlawful removal or alteration of records. All of these statutes are listed on our website. We have a handout. There's a link to all of our public records laws. So to begin on the program responsibilities and benefits, a logical place to start would be, what is a public record? Public records are defined in statute. Again, I'm sorry I'm throwing out a lot of statutes. 1-200 uh, part five, as any recorded data or information related to the conduct of public's business prepared, owned, used, received, or retained by a public agency. Government records are classified as public records regardless of the format, paper, electronic, microfilm, or regardless of the level of access, whether it's open or if it's restricted. The second important definition um, that you should know about is what is records management. It is the efficient and systematic control of records from creation to disposition. And the key word here is systematic. Records management is also the processes necessary to capture and maintain evidence of 
and information about business activities and transactions in the form of records. Managing records needs to be a part of a department's normal workflow. There should be policies in place which identify how the records are handled at each phase of the life cycle. Employees also need to be aware of the policies and training should be provided either through the town, state agency, or conducted by our office. We work very closely with CCM, which is the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, to coordinate municipal training sessions each year. We give high-level workshops on our program details. Under the statutes, a state agency municipality is responsible for inventorying their records. This would include what records, the types of records, identifying essential records. It also would include who has the records, who's the records custodian, where are the records located. Another responsibility is protecting the municipality, municipality or agency by obtaining permission to dispose of records and by proper disposal of the records after they are no longer useful, and protecting historical records by transferring those records to the state archives or to an approved archival facility. State agencies in Connecticut must designate an agency RMLO, that is a records management liaison officer. The RMLO serves as an important individual who works with our office on preparing and approving agency retention schedules. They also review agency disposal authorizations. It is also essential that they disseminate records management information to their agency personnel. Employees must be familiar with our Public Records Policy 5, which is our disposition policy, as well as our retention schedules that apply to his or her particular function within the town or state agency. Our office sets the minimum retention period. After the records have been met and the approval of disposition has been obtained, it's important at that point to dispose of the records and arrange or arrange for transfer to an approved archival repository. It's not a good practice to retain records just in case. These are just a few points that address the purpose of having a records management program. In bullet point number one, it states, ensure the continuity of operations in the event of a disaster. It is important to know the effect that a disaster can have on a town or state agency. Having a good records management program will help identify and protect essential operational records. Another purpose of a good records management program is to identify and classify records that need to be retained and accounted for over time. This is where we assist in the development of records retention schedules. It is also essential that there are guidelines to assist towns and agencies in maintaining, using, and controlling both their active records and their inactive records. My professor, Dr. Mark Langamo at the University of North Dakota, he wrote a book, Winning Strategies for Successful Records Management Programs. Many of the points I'm going to cover here are listed in his top-selling publication. A successful records management program results in many benefits. Organized record systems allow for better access to information. If employees have instant access to complete and accurate records, they can perform their work more efficiently. What happens when you can't find the information you need quickly? Decisions are delayed, which can be more costly. So records management results in increased efficiencies, reduced costs, and provides for good customer service. Retention schedules and disposition procedures provide the framework for identifying valuable records. Routine review of records for disposal means that agencies and towns are not paying for filing equipment, electronic file storage, or off-site facilities to store records that have already met their retention requirements. This will result in reduced storage requirements as well as reduce records volume. 
Disposal of records according to established protocols ensures transparency and legally defensible destruction. What in the world is that? This is the practice of systematically disposing of records or data that is no longer needed for legal reasons, regulatory, or business purposes. Proper storage of records protects records integrity and reduces the risk of damage, loss, or unauthorized access. Disaster recovery planning ensures that vital data and record series are identified and protected. For example, records that document citizen rights, such as land and vital records, are protected and maintained as permanent records. When essential operational records are identified and addressed in a town agency continuity of operations plan, access to these records during and following an emergency will provide vital government services. And finally, an important benefit is that a good records management program supports the identification and preservation of the historical record. Records with enduring value are maintained permanently by a town or state agency or transferred to the state archives or other approved archival repository, as I've mentioned a few times. Here is a slide that shows the importance of implementing good records management practices. In the before photo is a municipal storage area. You can see that it would be very difficult trying to access files that are stored in this condition. The town hired a records management consultant as a part of the historic document preservation grant program. The after photo show you, shows you the result of good records management practices. The town created a file room for municipal box storage. The files were organized and labeled, which made access and retrieval of these records much more efficient. Can an organization operate efficiently when its records are kept like this? The inefficiencies of the paper files in these photos are obvious, but many people mistakenly believe that the electronic records don't need to be managed. They want to convert everything to an electronic image or file, believing that the computer search function is going to find anything stored in that system. However, an improperly identified electronic record can be just as lost as these improperly identified paper records. Notice on the left that the file names are a series of numbers. You would have to open each file to determine what its contents are. Folder hierarchies and consistent file names are essential. These are true life images. <laughs> so this concludes the first part on records responsibilities and benefits. Elise is now going to discuss records concepts and management. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to see all of you today. We've been talking broadly about records management programs, so now I'm going to go into some specifics on important concepts in records management. Before I begin, what we're discussing today relates to records requirements for Connecticut state agencies, municipalities, certain quasi-public agencies, and other political subdivisions of the state. So when I say agency or public agency, I'm referring to all of these groups. So to get started, what is a record? Many of us work with a lot of information every day that supports the work we do, but not all of this information qualifies as a record. Records are subsets of the information that document the agency's business activities and functions. There are two parts to defining information as a record. It needs to relate to our work, and in order to be documented, it must be recorded in some way. A conversation in the hall with a coworker wouldn't be a record, but if you go back and write it in an email, now you have a record. We also need to make sure our records are created and maintained in a way to ensure that they are authentic, complete, reliable, and usable. Otherwise, they cannot be trusted to, as properly documenting business activities. And when we're talking about records for public agencies, we're talking about public records, which Leanne defined earlier. And the term public records can be confusing. 
Public records are not just records open to public inspection. Public records are all the records documenting the public's business. So some of these can be confidential or restricted, but they are still defined as public records. So all public agency records are public records, and all of them are subject to the same records management requirements. The statute also establishes it doesn't matter the format that the record is in, whether it's paper, microfilm, email, something else, written on a rock, whatever. But the way you determine if something is a record is never about the format. It's about the actual information that's being communicated or documented in that email or that piece of paper or in that computer file. If it relates to our agency's work, it's a record. But it's also important to know that the statute does not differentiate between an original and all of the duplicates that exist, such as multiple copies of a printed report or a PDF email to several people. All of these are public records. Although all copies of a record are public records, our records retention requirements only apply to the official record copy of a record. So what is the official record copy? It's defined as the specific copy designated by the agency as the legally recognized copy that is maintained for records retention, preservation, and authentication purposes. All of the duplicate copies are considered non-records. Sometimes it's very obvious which is the record copy, such as the official record copy for fiscal transactions would most likely be held by the fiscal office. In cases where it's not as clear cut, the agency needs to make a determination so everyone knows which one is the record copy as well as who is responsible for taking care of it. We call this person the records custodian. This is the person or department that's responsible for the custody and care of the records in day-to-day -day operations. It's also the person who does the first sign off on a records disposal request and certifies that the records are eligible for disposal. It's not necessarily the person who created the records. For example, the department head might be serving as the custodian for the records in a particular department. And although the re records requirements only apply to the official record copy, we need to manage all of the non-record copies as well. Other non-records that need to be managed include materials that don't document an agency's work and were never records to begin with. Published materials that you're maintaining for reference only, such as books, manuals, or professional journals, or unsolicited materials like catalogs, brochures, newsletters from other organizations, anything like that. And this applies regardless of format. So think of all the emails like sales announcements that you get. Those are non-records. Usually it's fairly easy to distinguish non-records, but sometimes things are not as clear cut. It always comes back to looking at whether the information is documenting the agency's work. For example, when you open the mail, is the envelope a record? It depends, usually not. But if you need to know if it was postmarked by a certain date, it might be a record. And we need to manage records from their creation through their disposition, which is also known as the records life cycle. It's not much different than any other life cycle. If you think about it, every record is either created or received, used to support the agency's function maintained over time to meet ongoing needs and then disposed. And like Leanne mentioned, when you think of here dispose, you might think discard or destroy, but it actually refers to the final action taken with a record, either destroying, transferring, for example, to an archives, or even maintaining it permanently. So if you think about that maintain stage of the life cycle, how do you know how long to maintain a record? A few months, forever, something in between? To answer this question, we use retention schedules. Our office is responsible for the development and maintenance of records retention schedules for all public agencies. The schedules identify all of the record series that towns and agencies have and tell them how long to keep them and their disposition, destroy, transfer, or keep permanently. This is an example of one of our municipal retention schedules, which is for electors and election rec records. You can see we have a series number, title, description, retention period, and disposition. We also have a notes field where we include additional information, such as related statutes or regulations, a designation of essential record, which means the records are essential for the functioning of the organization and must be available during or immediately after a crisis to continue operations without the delay. And the notes field is also where we will designate if the records have historical value, meaning they may be transferred to an archival repository. And something to note, just because a record is listed on a schedule does not mean an organization is required to create the records. 
Conversely, if an agency has a record and it is not listed anywhere, they are not automatically permitted to destroy the record. They must receive approval from our office prior to destruction, and we will need to add the records into a new series on the schedule before we approve that destruction. As I mentioned, records retention schedules are made up of record series rather than listing individual records. Record series are a group of records that relate to a specific activity and tend to be used and filed together. If we list the records individually, you can imagine how long the list would be. If you're looking for a record on a schedule, look for a bigger picture series rather than a single record. This slide shows one example. All of these various items, like applications, forms, and schedules, relate to each other and fall under a single series, volunteer and community service files. Once a series is identified, we need to determine the retention period. When setting retention, we do careful evaluation to understand the value of the series and for how long the records retain that value. We do research into statutory and other requirements and discuss with end users who work directly with the records. Retention periods are set based on the four values listed on the right here. For administrative value, it's how the records assist the agency in performing its primary functions and to operate effectively. Records with legal value show legal compliance or provide evidence of legal rights for the agency or the individuals it serves. Records with fiscal value document financial rights and obligations. And some records will have ongoing historical and research value, which is determined by our state archive staff. But the interesting thing is that these types of values the records have can overlap with each other and can change over the record's life cycle. For example, a record might have administrative value for a relatively short time, but then need to be maintained much longer for fiscal or legal reasons. Ultimately, the retention period is based on looking at all of the values and then setting the retention according to the longest one. That's why it's common for agencies to have active records, but also a large number of boxes and filing cabinets, like we saw in those pictures, filled with records no longer needed for everyday work, but they need to be retained for retention requirements. These are called inactive records. We're not that well organized, but we know where everybody is. I'm sure we've all experienced not being able to find something when we needed it. The physical management of records is an important aspect to a successful records management program. We all know how incredibly frustrating and time consuming it can be to look for records, and this can quickly turn into a major problem if a record is completely lost as a result of poor management. One element of managing records is it should be a routine operation. While we would like it to happen automatically, it's actually necessary to set aside time on a regular basis to manage records. We advise agencies to take the time to develop a standardized filing system for both their paper and electronic records. It's a lot of work up front, but it's critical for a successful records management program. Filing systems should be logical and consistent, providing flexibility to accept changes and new items, but simple enough so they're easy to understand. Using dates and clear file naming is important. Think of your own records at home. How would you organize what you have so you could find it quickly? We also advise having a centralized filing system where possible, so anyone who needs to work with the records has easy access. Many towns and agencies also use off-site storage to store their inactive records, and we have the State Record Center that we manage for state agencies, and we actually handle the destruction of their records as well. As I mentioned earlier, it's important to remember records management principles are format neutral. The same basic principles always apply whether you're dealing with paper or electronic records. And if there is an electronic and paper version of the same document, it's important to clearly identify which is the official record copy so it can be managed according to retention requirements. Electronic records are challenging to manage, sometimes even more challenging than paper records, largely due to a lack of physical presence, out of sight, out of mind, and, you know, oh, we have space for everything. Not true. Um, and with the volume of electronic records we have today, good management is critical. And electronic records actually require more active management than paper records. Hard copy records, like paper or microfilm, can be put into a basic record storage room and will still be in good condition several hundred years later. Compare that to something you might have stored at home on old floppy disks or files created using a program that no longer exists. You might not be able to open these records now. 
I actually just found a bunch of CDs and was trying to play them, and they're not working very well. And they're only 20 years old, so, you know. Um, Barbara talked a lot about this in more detail in our last session, so you can view that to learn about actual longevity of all of these different types of media. And I would also like to point out that email is a record. It should be treated as correspondence. And it should be retained by its content. It could be related to a project. It could just be routine correspondence or transitory. Transitory emails, such as you know, copies, solicitations, they're considered non-records, so they can be disposed of when no longer needed. And email can be very complicated to manage. I know everyone has challenges because of the volume of emails we get. My inbox is overflowing, so it's, I, you know, I'm not practicing what I preach here. One management tool is to actually try to limit your emails. Do you even need to send that email? Does everyone need to be forwarded that email? Can you send a link instead of an attachment? Maybe we can cut down on some of it. You know. Any emails sent from public agencies are public records, so the more we have, the more you have to sift through if you're requested records. And a private email should not be used to conduct public business because they are still public records and they can be subject to disclosure and discovery. And Broadly, when we're talking about electronic records, we actually have two categories that are based on their origin, and they each come with their own challenges. So born digital records are records that begin life in electronic format, like a report written in Word, an electronically submitted form, or records in a database. Emails are also born digital. And digitized records are those where the or original record is in hard copy format, usually paper, and the records are scanned and stored as digital images. So we often hear statements like, we're drowning in paper, we need to scan everything, or we're moving to a paperless office. In most cases, it is not a reasonable goal for an agency to digitize all of its records. To reduce paper, it's best to implement a hybrid strategy, scanning certain groups where it makes sense and leaving the rest on paper. In many cases, it's actually less expensive to store paper records for the required retention and then destroy them than it is to scan and maintain electronically, especially if you are scanning and maintaining them properly. The cost for that can be exorbitant. We advise only digitizing records that are frequently accessed and would help improve workflows. We also advise against scanning records close to filling, fulfilling retention requirements. And records that are past their retention should be destroyed rather than digitized. It's also important to consider any legal requirements to maintain certain records in their original paper format. And records that won't scan clearly you should have a hard copy backup to preserve the full content of the record. And once scanned, there are additional factors to consider. It's not enough to simply scan. You must properly name and organize with proper metadata so they are easily identifiable and retrievable. And a lot of people are used to being able to search in text and PDF documents, but that technology is not foolproof. It is necessary to include metadata and appropriate file names in order to locate the records. You cannot count on just being able to search and find whatever you need in a document. And not all PDFs are correctly scanned in a way where you can get all the text, or they might be handwritten. Adding metadata to digitized records is a labor-intensive process, but it's absolutely critical. We have policies and standards that set the requirements and best practices for digitization projects, and agencies are required to follow our standards, especially if they wish to dispose of any of the paper after scanning. And part of managing records is routine destruction of records that have met their retention. We have policies that outline proper procedures for records destruction. Public agencies must submit a form to our office to obtain authorization to destroy the records. This is a requirement for both hard copy and electronic records, including email. It is best to dispose of records in a timely manner and not retain past their retention unless there is a specific need to keep the records longer, not just in case. Records may not be destroyed if there is a pending action, such as an audit, freedom of information request, legal hold, anything like that. And our office recommends that when destroying, method, uh, destroying records, it is important that the records are destroyed utilizing a method that ensures the total destruction of the record. For hard copy, such as paper, microfilm, you should shred the records and recycle them if you can. Electronic media, such as floppy disks, compact disks, VHS tapes, 
They should be overwritten or erased, but in some cases, you might have to physically destroy the media. That might be the best way to destroy the data permanently. And the signed disposition form documents approval of the records being destroyed, but not the actual destruction of the records. So in order to follow good records management practices and for legal reasons, it's important for agencies to actually document the destruction date and method of destruction after the records are destroyed. And as I mentioned earlier, on our retention schedules, we list the final disposition for records. At the end of their life cycle, some records may be destroyed well, some permanent records must be maintained permanently by the agency. An example of this would be vital records, such as birth certificates, that are maintained permanently in municipal vaults by town clerks. For other records with historical value, they can be transferred to an approved archival repository, such as a local historical society or the state archives. And Alan will now talk about the appraisal process for determining which records have historical value and can be sent to an archival repository. Thank you. Right. So what makes a record historically valuable and how do we determine that? So, um, and this is going to be very high level because there's a lot of theory involved and uh, over time. So I'm going to keep it very high level. And um, archival appraisal criteria is used by archivists at the state archives to determine if a record is historically valuable and is an archival record. I thought I would start out with a quote to kind of frame what I'm going to talk about today. And so as I was looking around the quote from uh, Jerry Hamm, who was the past president of the Society of American Archivists in 1974, so we've been talking about appraisal for a long time. I thought this kind of phrased it fairly well to talk about sort of what archivists do, which is our most important and intellectually demanding task as archivists is to make an informed selection of information that will provide the future with representative, representative record of human experience in our time. One word that I want to point out in the quote is selection. So you have appraisal and then there's selection. And, and so um, that includes selection. And selection is defined as the process of identifying which records to retain because of their enduring value. So how do, we, how do we begin? And so archival appraisal and selection starts with understanding what is the state library, and more specifically, what we do in the state archives, is what is our documentary goals? Why does the archives exist? And what purpose does the archives serve? A lot of those have been answered. Oops, a lot of those have been answered. Um, and to understand those goals, we need to uh, consider the following, which is, the as you've heard already a couple times, the State Library's mission, which is to preserve and make accessible Connecticut's history and heritage, and to advance the development of library services statewide. Uh, next, we look at the, the legislative intent and requirements as set forth in the statutes. And so, as uh, previous others have mentioned, we have statutes 11.8 AC um, says that you know the the state librarian has the authority to identify uh, state archivist. As the, as the representative of the state library, has the authority to identify and retain those records that are of historical value to the state. Next, we have uh, the collection and development pol collection policy, which uh, the state archives also guides our decision making. And this was approved by the State Library Board in 1991 and defines what records have archival or enduring informational value. It is up on our website. Feel free to read it. Um, this is under. Uh, currently under review and revision because it is well over 30 years old at this point and times have changed. Um, and then not last but not least and is we also have a couple uh, policy statements and guidelines on how we do appraisal and um, one specifically on architectural records because it seems like in the last decade we've taken in a lot of architectural records so we've kind of identified what we look at there. Um, the mission statutes collection policy and appraisal policy and guidelines direct the documentary goals of the state archives and assist staff in making decisions on appraisal and selection of historically valuable records. So what is an archival record? Records created or received by a person, family, or organization, public or private, in the conduct of their affairs and, uh, and preserved because of, of enduring value continued 
value contained in the information they contain or as evidence of the function and responsibility of the of their creator responsibility of the creator government government records specifically and i will note that we also do take in manuscript materials which are personal papers from private individuals and organizations but i'm focusing specifically here today on government records and and the, the appraisal follows similar similar pathways um, government records possess archival or enduring value if they contain information which uh, satisfies one of the following. Documents the evolution of organizations, policies, and pr uh, practices of state government. Documents claims or petitions made on state government by citizens and the disposition of those claims and petitions. Documents obligations and claims made on citizens by state government and the disposition. Uh, documents the legal and legislative history of our state, and contains secondary informational value useful for studying a variety of subjects beyond the functions and pur purposes of a public agency, such as uh, commerce, culture and society, uh, education, legal theory, and a multitude of subjects. By documenting institutional functions, activities, and decision-making, archivists provide an important means of ensuring accountability. In a republic, such accountability and transparency constitute an essential hallmark of democracy. Public leaders must be accountable both to the judgment of history and future generations, as well as to citizens in the ongoing governance of society. So getting more specifically into what archival appraisal is, archival appraisal is defined as the process of determining whether records and other materials have permanent or research value. So we saw the disposition of the life cycle. So either they're going to be disposed of legally following our practice, uh, policies and procedures. Um, so either they're going to get disposed of, shredded, or they're likely going to be retained by the agency because they have permanent value or value in that matter, or they're going to be transferred to the state archives or uh, archival repository that's approved. Uh, Archival appraisal is different, I want to be clear about this, it's different from monetary appraisal, which estimates fair market value. The state library or its staff, according to IRS rules, we cannot appraise any materials for monetary value, nor can staff recommend specific appraisers. It's also different than records management appraisal, which is typically used to indicate a preliminary assessment of value depending upon the reten existing retention schedules. Trained professional archivists appraise records by looking at several different values, and you heard value, at least mentioned values as well, which are very similar, based on the original purpose of the records for the creating agency. So we have primary value, which is agencies create records to meet their administrative, legal, or fiscal needs. Records often have more than one value and can also change over time and can overlap. So it can be changed. And there's some examples here of, of administrative, legal, and fiscal record, record types um, that you might find in these different categories. Archival, uh, in addition, records also possess evidential and informational value beyond the original value by the creating public agency. Evidential value provides information about the origins, functions, and activities of their creator. Informational value is a usefulness or significance based on reason or based on records, content independent of any intrinsic, and I'll talk about intrinsic in a minute, or evidential value. This information is valuable for studying historical events, social developments, or other subjects beyond, uh, beyond the reason that the agency created the records. And you'll see some examples here of evidential and uh, informational uh, value type records that you might find. This is, this is not exhaustive. The state archives may acquire government records which, have, which lack high informational value but which possess compelling intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is the usefulness or significance of a record derived from its physical or associated, associational qualities inherent in its original form and generally independent of its content that are integral to its material matter, or material nature, excuse me, and would be lost in reproduction. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, 
Records determined to have intrinsic value contain some of the following characteristics, characteristics and this is by no means exhaustive either. Uh, physical forms that may be a subject for study. So how did, how did a particular artwork be, you know, how did that form, how was it physically created? Uh, aesthetic or artistic qualities, unique or cur uh, curious physical features. Um, age that provides a quality of uniqueness, value for, uh, uh, for use in exhibits, and general and substantial public interest because of direct association with famous and historically significant people, places, things, issues, or events in the state. An example uh, that came to my mind pretty, uh, was of intrinsic value, but it, could all, it also has legal value, is this petition submitted by Sarah Walsher in 1723 to the New Haven County, New Haven County Superior Court for, uh, for divorce from her uh, long-gone husband, Peter. She argued that every enterprise he launched failed and that he left her and her children penniless. However, for intrinsic value, you will notice the drawing of the gravestone around the content of the petition. So that gives you an idea of intrinsic value, one idea of many. Uh, in making the final decision on whether to acquire archival records, the state archives also considers other factors, such as the ability to provide suitable space, staffing, supplies, and equipment, uh, the ability to provide sufficient support to preservation and uh, access to archival records, and hear about preservation from Damon in a second, and confidentiality and freedom of information. The state library conforms to all statutes, rulings, and regulations pertaining to access. Confidentiality by itself uh, does not uh, constitute grounds for refusing records, although we have to take that into account as we make our decisions. While the lack of one or more of these factors does not constitute a compelling reason for not for refusing records, deficiencies may, may, uh, may uh, delay the process for bringing those into our door. And if there was a major deficiency, which we've had in our history, if there's a major deficiency, then we have to, um, you know, take priority of state government records before other records. Um, and then the appraisal process. So, so these archivists determine a record's archival value during the appraisal process. And this can happen in, at many different times and can happen simultaneously or independently, these, these different processes. Uh, there are several steps that can occur, as I mentioned, simultaneously or, in other, uh, or independently. During the records retention schedule development, which you heard from, from uh, Leanne and Elise, we are involved in, in that as well. And we look at, um, we may flag record series that look interesting on a retention schedule um, as archival, and we may flag as archival be required. Um, and uh, uh, during the development of the schedule, we may also talk with, definitely do talk with the subject matter experts about, hey, what's your records entail? This looks really interesting. Can we see it? And sometimes when we see it, it doesn't necessarily meet, the, meet what we thought in that. Um, during the dis disposal re request review, so when records are eligible for disposition, archive staff uh, will conduct um, an analysis. Sometimes, you know, like fiscal records, we know that typically we aren't going to take those unless there's something unique going on. Um, in other instances, we might go, what is this about? And we'll reach out to the records custodian to say, hey, or the records management liaison officer, hey, what, what is, what's going on here? Um, and so, uh, and we may look at samples and, and all of that. And things may not have been flagged early in the, in the retention schedule process, but later on, a public agency, when they request disposal, we may determine that a series or a portion of a series has, has uh, uh, value and should be retained. So an example, like you know, we have the pandemic or we have the pandemic, and so we're looking closer at records from that period that may not have been flagged originally as having archival value. Also, prior to transfer, we may, we may do appraisal, um, viewing the records at the time of accessioning, so when they come through our door, and then during archival processing, uh, where the records are being fully arranged and described. And what I mean by that is we're, we're looking at them, you know, we get the boxes in or the items in, and we're rehousing them in archival quality materials. Um, and we might come across bo a box or folders of non-records, and so we will make appraisal at the time of we're doing our work. Um, so now you will hear from Damon about the State Archives care, how the State Archives cares for and preserves our archival records. All right, thank you, Alan. Okay, as Alan discussed how we determine what records we take, 
into the State Archives, I will discuss how we preserve, care, and protect those records in our custody. Preservation is a topic that could be discussed for an entire day or even an entire week. But I will keep it simple and highlight the important factors in preserving and protecting these records. Also, emergency and disaster preparedness is another topic that is essential to protecting the records and can be discussed at length, but that will have to wait for another time. As stated previously, part of the State Library's mission is to preserve and make accessible Connecticut's history and heritage. We have the responsibility and duty to ensure records under our care are kept safe and protected, not only for the present, but also far into the future. Some responsibilities in keeping the records safe include in providing safe and secure storage spaces. Our storage spaces are not open to the public uh, to browse. Only authorized staff can access the spaces, and they are monitored 24 hours a day to prevent damage or loss to the records. The environment is also monitored, which I will discuss later. When researchers wish to view uh, the records, that is done in a secured area, monitored by staff, where there are additional rules, such as no pens, food, or drink. We want individuals to be able to view and use the records, but at the same time, we must ensure the records are kept safe. At times, conserving the records might be needed for the records to last. I will elaborate on that a little bit later. Okay. Most of the time, the terms preservation and conservation are used interchangeably. In many ways, conservation is a part of preservation. Some examples of preservation include monitoring the environment the records are kept in, which include temperature and humidity. Um, having proper enclosures for the records, such as a phase box, storing items correctly, such as keeping large volumes flat, write in a plan in case of emergencies, and scan in records. Conservation refers to the treatment and repair of records to slow the process of decay or restore them to usable state. As you can imagine, sometimes we receive records in less than ideal state. Poor choices in adhesive and inks can cause deterioration or damage. The wrong kind of glue can dry out and the book will just fall apart. As Lizette spoke in the last presentation, acidic ink can damage the paper. In the 19th century, iron gall ink was common, but it is acidic and can make a hole where the writing used to be. Paper clips and staples are usually made of metal uh, that rest over time. A rusty staple may leave a permanent stain when removed, and because the rust makes it scratchy, the staple may tear the paper. Less than ideal storage conditions and wear and tear dramatically decrease any record's lifespan. Creating a stable environment is one of the most important things we can do to maintain the record's physical sta stability. Stable, yeah, make it stable. <laughs> For paper and books, the recommended environment is a constant year-round temperature of 7 degrees or cooler and relative humidity of 30 to 50 percent. Achieving this year-round for a whole building is expensive and time-consuming as it requi requires constant monitoring. Even at a large institution with multiple facilities, like the State Library, it can be a struggle to achieve this stable environment. A more realistic approach is to create an environment that only allows minimal daily and gradual changes from one season to the next. Pictured here is a digital hygrometer thermometer similar to what we use to monitor the environment. Properly storing and housing the records is just as important as monitoring the environment. We do not use any wood shelves as wood tends to off-gas and absorb water. We only use powder-coated metal shelving. We ensure records and books are shelved flat and re rearranged so larger volumes are stored below smaller ones. The records must be fully supported by the shelf and are not overhanging the edge. For oversized materials such as maps, 
You can see we use large map cabinets. All our shelving, including the map cabinets, are at least four inches off the ground to help protect the records in the event of a water intrusion into the space. Materials used to make folders and storage boxes have an important, I'm sorry, have an impact on the longevity of the records. The materials we use are acid and lignin free. Lignin is a natural component of wood pulp used to make paper and cardboard. As time goes by, it causes paper to turn yellow, which might not affect the strength of the paper, but it could decrease readability. There are safe plastics as well, as, um, but we do not use anything made with polyvinyl chloride. I know, sorry to get a little technical, but basically PVC, um, you know, that, that does have chemicals that are harmful to humans. Here are some common items we find when, take, when we take the records in which can cause damage. Rubber bands which dry up, break, and may leave a stain on paper. They also pinch or tear paper, especially fragile or brittle paper. Paper clips and staples are usually made of metals and rust over time, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, sticky notes left on documents or photographs can leave the adhesive on the item and often lifts the ink off the page when removed. We always wash our hands well before handling archival records. Handling the paper can leave your hands dry, but lotions, even the greaseless uh, kind, can leave a residue. We only wear gloves when handling photographs, films, or negatives to prevent, to prevent leaving oils and dirt from our skin on them. If a record is in poor condition, we will make a photocopy or scan of the original in order for the copy to be accessible to individuals. We restrict the original, avoiding any, any more wear and tear on the actual record. When a scan is made, there is a potential for it to be made available online. This allows the content of that record to be accessed by a wider audience, which is not restricted to just visiting the State Library. As I mentioned earlier, Sometimes conserving a record is essential in making sure it is around for future use. When a record is in such poor or bad condition, we may send it out to a professional conservator who will attempt to restore the record to a usable condition while stabilizing it to prevent further decay. The conservator will carefully examine the record to decide what techniques and materials will be appropriate. Often the conserved record should be used rarely and with extra care and handling. As you can see, these are some of the recommendations a conservator might suggest. The State Library does not have a conservator on staff, but we work with an outside professional conservation vendor to repair and treat records. So in conclusion, State Archive staff are responsible for the care of records, including determining the appropriate preservation actions to ensure archival records maintain stable and usable now and into the future. Thank you. Great, thank you Leanne and Elise and Alan and Damon. Uh, that was really, really good. Uh, we're not, we're going to open it up for questions now from the public. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, just uh, raise your hand and I will come to you with a mic. And uh, let me also check real quick if we have any questions from our audience online. Remember, if you are watching online, you can post your question in the comments section of the video. Okay, so any questions here from the in-person audience? No? Okay, I can't see anything online either. 
Okay, well, you covered everything so well. No one has any questions. <laughs> okay, but we are running uh, up to an hour, so we're running uh, out of time. So I want to thank everybody for uh, coming in person and also for watching online. Also, thank you again to all of our speakers. Uh, our next installment of the uh, States Filing Cabinet will be on the 22nd of June, also a Thursday, right here at Connecticut's Old State House, and we will also be streaming that as well. Uh, we hope to see you there for the last installment of the series. And uh, also this Saturday is uh, Connecticut Open House Day, and we will be open uh, for the public, and we will also be having a walking tour around the Old State House, an outdoor walking tour around the Old State House starting at 1130 with a uh, historian, Dan, uh, Dan Sterner, who will be running the tour. And uh, we would also love to, to see you there for that as well. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Mm.